everybody. I think I'll take this opportunity first to tell you about myself. Because <laughs> so, then once I introduce people to you, then we'll get on with the panel. So, um, I did grow up in a Bohemian San Francisco family. All, um, my part was here in Berkeley. Um, my dad was Imogen Cunningham's son. And when he was 17, he decided he wanted to be a photographer himself. So this was a small group of California photographers at the time. Mm -hmm. So Imo sent him out to work first with Ansel Adams and mm -hmm. then with Dorothea Lange. And he really bonded with Dorothea. And not only was he her assistant, he gradually became not just her apprentice, but um, almost like half son. Um, so that as we grew up here in Berkeley with Dorothea, also in Berkeley, we got blended into that family and we spent all of our, um, all of the holidays with her, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Fourth of July. The, so that was my cousin Rat Pack, actually, was Dorothea's family. So in case there's like one person here who doesn't know about Dorothea's photographs, this is my most famous photograph of my grandmother. Um, she's also known for White Angel Breadline, which is the very first photograph she took when she left her, her portrait studio in San Francisco. She walked down onto the street and said, I have to photograph what's happening around me. And she took this amazing, amazing photograph, which, as my father always said about this photograph, look at their hats. These amazing hats that show you, some of them were working men, but others were bankers and lawyers and business people, who, because that's that their hats signify the kind of life that they were leading. So Dorothea spent many years working for, well, Four, I think. Is that right, Diana? Resettlement Working for the FSA? Resettlement Administration? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, then. Um, and the Farm Security Administration. Yeah. Right. Um, Diana Taylor is here taking a picture of me, which I asked her to do. <laughs> <laughs> she is going to be talking to you tomorrow. I'm part of the rat pack. She is, yeah. She's my rat pack. <laughs> she is Dorothea's granddaughter. <laughs> the actual granddaughter as opposed to goddaughter. Anyway, we are dear, dear, dear yeah. friends. We've known each other all our lives. Mm -hmm. So Dorothea spent this amazing amount of time photographing the effects of the Great Depression on the American public. And the work was gotten put into magazines and newspapers so that people could see what the plight of other people actually was. And uh, this is one of the early um, <coughs> things that she did. And she, um, that's actually her previous first husband, Maynard Dixon, wrote the text, mm -hmm. the hand calligraphy for this. All races work the crops in California. Sometimes the real strength of her images lies not in the image, but in the caption. She was a brilliant captioner. This photograph, which looks fairly innocent, is titled future voter and his Mexican father. <laughs> that is a brilliant caption. So she also uh, photographed through the South a couple times and um, did, she was, you know, she, was, she had trained herself as a portrait photographer. So this is just an absolutely beautiful portrait. And she was um, told by her boss, Roy Stryker, not to photograph so many Negroes. Um, oh. Because he said he can't get the public sympathy for a photograph of a Negro as opposed to a white person. But one of the things Dorothea said that has always stood with me all my life, she said, I have a great instinct for freedom. Anybody cuts into that and I churn. Well, she just went ahead and did exactly what she had been doing, which is to our benefit today because we have just an amazing array of photographs that she did. Fortunately, she did not listen to her boss. 
So this is my dad around about the time that he was uh, working for, this a little bit after he was working for her, out there with his camera. He took some absolutely amazing photographs of Dorothea. You can, whenever you look at a photograph, you can see how much the person trusts the photographer. Mm -hmm. And you just can really see that in this photograph, how relaxed and open she is in this photograph. That's her camera right next to her. So though this is women in the spirit of the New Deal, I'm going to show you a few photographs that my dad took because he got hired by the National Youth Authority. Is it authority? Administration. Thank you, Harvey. I always stumble over that. To photograph youth during this same time and um, he did some just truly, truly beautiful photographs. As he was wandering around with Dorothea, he was taking these photos. This one is one of my favorites. <coughs> this woman is a, a potato picker. She's, she's got to fill that sack with potatoes. These photographs that my dad took are all available at the National Archives. Dorothea Lang's photos are all available at the Library of Congress. You can download all of this stuff in high res. So I encourage you to go look and use whatever you would like. Um, this, my, my dad was taught to title by Dorothea. My dad could barely say the alphabet front to back, so I know he had help with these captions on the spelling. So this was in Hayward. He took this photo, Youth on Relief, high school student calling for surplus commodities for his family on relief. What I love about this photograph is his shoes. You know, you can see he's a high school styler. Yeah. You know, this guy, he's got his white shoes on. But he's bringing home a big sack of food so he and his family can eat. Oh. <laughs> this is not a particularly great photograph, but here we are. So. That's pretty cool. It is interesting that these are all guys. You know, it made me wonder, like, how many of these people, you know, what were the ratio of men to women going to college in those days? When was that taken? Uh, this was either 1939 or 1940. Um, and actually, he did a beautiful bunch of photographs of peace strikes that were going on at the time. So um, I graduated here from UC Berkeley in 1973 and we did not yet have a women's studies department but I had an individual major that I titled socialization of women uh, so I consider that I was one of the early people to graduate in women's studies from here <laughs> and I had never spoken here at UC Berkeley and here I am today yeah. <laughs> to get every we we're on quarters and every quarter I had to have my um, class plan uh, signed off on by an advisor in letters and science and I had a very 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 old man older than any of in this any of us in this room I am sure he was so old and every semester, every quarter he said he would sign it and say to me you are wasting your education. We are all here to say we did not waste our education. <laughs> We're still at it, which is great. So this is a photograph my dad took of Dorothea um, in the last year before she died. She was setting up a show of her work for uh, Museum of Modern Art in New York City, which she did not live to see uh, put on, but she did live to get it put together. It's a beautiful photo. This is me when I knew, this is me toward, also towards the end of Dorothea's life. I'm, she's passing me a cup and saying, carefully, Bitsy, carefully, which was like one of the mottos of her life. Another being, what did you do today? 
you know, she was the matriarch of our family, a very strong and powerful woman, had more influence on me than anyone else has had then or since. She's still with me. And um, she did all this work with Paul Schuster Taylor, her husband, who taught economics here at Cal. And uh, when we were growing up, Paul would try to snag us as we ran past playing. And he would say to us things like, well, what did you think of what happened today in politics, blah, blah, blah. And we'd be wanting to play with each other. And we'd sort of mutter something. And he'd say, the, chill, the problem with you kids today is you don't know anything about the New Deal. <laughs> Grab a hunk of lightning. Grab a hunk of lightning. Um, and this is what Diana will be talking about, the film she made, that I made the book to go with her film. Feels She'll be so talking fun. about that tomorrow and talking about a segment of Dorothea's work that's very unknown, which is a really wonderful. I'm going to end with one final slide of Dorothea's that she took in a gas station in Kern County in 1938. Um, it's very appropriate to today. Air, this is your country. Don't let the big men take it away from you. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to run down telling you about the amazing panel of speakers that we have here. Um, and then one by one, we'll come up and stand here so we can, you know, be in touch with our slides and not twisting our necks off. So Bridget is going to be the first person on the panel. She's an independent scholar who writes a lot on employment equity, especially for women in non-traditional jobs. And she did this great book. She was one of us, Eleanor Roosevelt and the American Worker, which she'll be talking about, Eleanor Roosevelt and Workers. Susan Quinn will be next, um, who started out as a newspaper reporter and has done a number of books also, including um, Furious Improvisation, How the WPA and a Cast of Thousands Made High Art Out of Desperate Times, as well as Eleanor and Hick, The Love Affair That Shaped the First Lady. Then we'll have Ashley Dennis, who is a doctoral student in the Department of African American Studies. And her research, she's got some wide-ranging research on black women's history, the history of education in the US, and 20th century urban history. Um, she's going to be talking about Mary Leo Bethune, who I'm, I'm looking forward to this. I don't know much about her. And last, we will have Stephanie Ann Johnson, who's a founding faculty member of the Visual and Public Arts Department at California State University, Monterey Bay. And I think there's nothing Stephanie doesn't do. She's just an amazing artist. She does mixed media. She's a writer. She's a performer and a lighting designer. So she's going to talk about African-American artists with a particular focus on Gwendolyn Bennett and Augusta Savage. OK, Bridget, come on up. Good afternoon. Uh, I am delighted to be here. It is such a treat, especially these days, to be in a room full of New Deal enthusiasts <laughs> and to be with the experts and family members of such wonderful leaders as Frances Perkins and Eleanor Roosevelt and Dorothea Lange and and all of the others. Uh, it is truly uh, an honor to be here. And what I'm going to do is, I think, uh, add another layer to much of what we heard this morning for how what Eleanor Roosevelt and Frances Perkins were, do, uh, were doing, uh, how that spirit of the New Deal uh, was shown uh, to working women, and especially uh, to union women, and how they carried that spirit on in a very day-to-day -day way of how to make the workplace better. I'll be talking about Rose Schneiderman, Rose Posota, mm -hmm. Dorothy Belonka, and Maida Springer, along with uh, labor educators and organizers like Hilda Worthington Smith and Lucy uh, Randolph Mason. So I like to, oh, it's working. 
Uh, I like to use this slide when I teach a workshop on union women's leadership uh, using the past to change the future. Mm -hmm. And we talk a lot about mentoring and coalition building. And these two women, uh, Eleanor and Frances, certainly knew a lot and did a lot of coalition building. And one of the things in terms of mentoring that I think they really symbolize, which is an important lesson for women today, is that you need to reach out and to work with women and men, other people who have complementary skills, who don't necessarily have the same skills or the same perspective that you have. And so as we heard, Frances Perkins was extremely good at writing legislation and wrangling with union leaders and employers and testifying before Congress, but she didn't like the press. She didn't want to deal with them. She didn't want to do public education. Uh, she valued Eleanor Roosevelt, who became a press person, uh, who, and, and in her heart, was a teacher. And so the whole public education role was one that uh, I think Frances Perkins was happy to have uh, Eleanor Roosevelt there uh, to do. And I, in this picture, I sort of see Eleanor Roosevelt floating down uh, the steps of the Congress looking uh, for the microphones. <laughs> but an important part of this coalition, uh, which was uh, central to having it be effective, was a woman named Rose Schneiderman. And Rose Schneiderman uh, was, she understood that you could have the best laws in the world, you could have uh, great PR, you could get your message out there, but if you didn't have a mechanism on the shop floor, the working girls weren't going to have better working conditions and better wages. And so she worked, and her mechanism to do that was the labor movement. Mm -hmm. And so she, uh, she was a cap maker by trade. She became an organizer for the International Lady Garment Workers Union, and eventually president of the Women's Trade Union League, which was a great coalition. And she um, uh, actually ran for uh, the U.S. Senate uh, in 1920 before she uh, actually met Eleanor Roosevelt. So she was politically engaged as well, and she brought all of this to the White House when Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt went to the White House. Frances Perkins appointed her to the Labor Advisory Board of the National uh, Recovery Administration, and she uh, was the only woman on that board, and she was particularly concerned with improving the wages and working conditions of women. We've heard a little bit uh, on several presentations about Puerto Rico. Uh, Mrs. Roosevelt going there, bringing her press corps with her, eventually uh, convincing the president to go there and see the horrible, deplorable living conditions and working conditions on the island. Uh, she spent almost as much time on Puerto Rico as she did on her subsistence homesteads and, and the beloved Arthurdale, which people know much more about. But what people often don't know is that Rose Schneiderman was already in uh, Puerto Rico as the, uh, part of the advisory board and communicating with Eleanor about who she should talk to, the employers she should visit, what hearings were coming up, and who she should write her famous letters to. Uh, and at the same time was another woman named Rose Posota. And Rose was the first woman uh, to become vice president of the International Lady Garment Workers Union. And she spent years in Puerto Rico and was so concerned about the conditions there. And uh, these women were not rubber stamping the New Deal. They were not naive. They wrote scathing reports to anyone who needed them, including Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, in fact, uh, criticizing both the employers who were trying to cheat on the system and, and it was voluntary and they weren't doing it, and the government administrators who weren't doing the job that they thought that they ought to be doing. So uh, I think as we think tomorrow about the New Deal today, Puerto Rico should be on the top of our list. Now another important part of the uh, New Deal that we've just had a little bit of references to is workers' education. And a, a critical woman uh, a spirit here is Hilda Worthington Smith. And Hilda was the dean of Bryn Mawr College. And she helped start and to really carry through the Bryn Mawr Summer School for uh, women in industry in the 1920s. And uh, she, that's, uh, was one of, that was the first, one of the first women's uh, summer schools uh, where the young women would come to the Bryn Mawr campus for two months and not only learn about organizing and collective bargaining and worker issues, but they learned history and English and poetry. Uh, and she and Eleanor uh, worked uh, together and then uh, Hilda came to Washington and met Harry Hopkins, and he convinced her she left Bryn Mawr and came to, uh, to be part of the Works Progress, the uh, 
Federal Emergency Relief Administration mm -hmm. setting up their worker education <laughs> programs, and she really spent the rest of her life getting government funding uh, to help workers' education to even begin to compete with what the business schools were doing. And, you know, in 1935, there were 45,000 students, 1,800 classes, 480 instructors, and 570 communities. And that was just in one year. And as for the summer schools, uh, they have changed over the years, but I, I'm happy to tell you that the Western Summer School for Union Women uh, was hosted this year by the UC Berkeley Labor Center. And I, I did the workshop on uh, learning from the past, change the future for the tradeswomen. The NRA was found to be, the NIRA was found to be unconstitutional. Uh, something people often don't know about the New Deal was the struggles that things got passed and then they got reversed and then they came back again. But the National Labor Relations Act was in Frances Perkins' hands and she uh, was clearly very, very uh, instrumental in having, uh, having that happen and it led to uh, an incredible surge in organizing for the labor movement. The United Auto Workers in one year went from 88,000 members to over 200,000 members. And so that was also an administrative uh, thing that, uh, that Frances Perkins had to deal with. But Eleanor, at the same time, was learning going far from the garment workers in New York City, although she never forgot them. But she was going into coal mines. She was writing for the mine workers uh, union newspaper. <laughs> She was working with auto workers and electricians and farm workers all across the country. And uh, a very important organizing drive, which is often left out of the history books, was in the South with the Tex uh, Textile Workers Organizing Committee. And here we have a wonderful woman leader by the name of Lucy Randolph Mason. She was a very Southern lady, a tiny, petite, white-haired woman who was the daughter of a minister and the daughter of the American Revolution and the daughter of the Confederacy. And she went into to social work, to uh, consumer uh, work, and she met John L. Lewis, the mighty leader of the United Mine Workers. And John L. Lewis in the 1930s hired Lucy Randolph Mason to represent the CIO and the industrial unions in their organizing drive in the South. And she opened doors for them, she opened editorial boards, she opened churches that they could have never gotten to without her, and she was very close to Eleanor Roosevelt and sent reports and arranged meetings, whether it was a, you know, an individual project or a, a, a whole city uh, that was under siege. And uh, she was uh, just a, a very important and little known uh, heroine of the labor movement. Now over top of all of these things that were going on with the labor movement surging, uh, the new laws in place, and the National Labor Relations Act really did solidify on a federal level that workers had a right to uh, form and to join unions. And that was quite revolutionary at the, at the time. Uh, but there was also very intricate political connections. And you had uh, women like Molly Dusen at the Democratic Party. You had women like Congresswoman Mary Norton. Now the National Labor Relations Act is known uh, informally as the Wagner Act, named after Senator Robert Wagner of New York, who was very important it would have never gotten to be law without Congresswoman Mary Norton pushing it through the U.S. House of Representatives. And uh, again, she was tied in with Frances Perkins and the Women's Trade Union League and, and all of these, this extraordinary uh, network of women. Uh, but also overlapping it was the labor movement and what the unions were doing. Now, not all the unions supported uh, the, the New Deal. In fact, uh, the AFL had always been neutral in presidential elections, and in 1932, there were only three unions that supported FDR. Uh, and one of them was Sidney Hillman of the Amalgamated Clothing Workers, who went on to have his own career within uh, the, the Roosevelt administration. But by 1935, uh, the unions, many of the unions, the industrial unions in particular, were so excited about Franklin Roosevelt that Sidney Hillman set up the first political action committee uh, Labor's Nonpartisan League. For better or worse, <laughs> he set up a political action committee. Um, and uh, John L. Lewis and the miners put in a half a million dollars, which was an extraordinary amount of money at the time. 
And women like Dorothy Belonka, who was a woman vice president of the Amalgamated Clothing Workers, were all very engaged in getting workers out to vote and in getting women out to vote in particular. And again, working closely uh, with Eleanor Roosevelt on that, on that task. And most of that half a million dollars went to Franklin Roosevelt's campaign. And finally, there was civil rights. And Eleanor Roosevelt um, strongly believed that you really, civil rights and workers' rights were very closely intertwined. And you really weren't gonna have a whole lot of progress on one without progress on the other. And so I just wanted to highlight two women here, Polly Murray, who I'm sure many of you do know about, who uh, met Eleanor Roosevelt in a she, she, she camp in the early 1930s. Wonderful uh, recent book on the firebrand and the first lady uh, by Pat Bell Scott. Uh, because Polly went on to become the first African woman, uh, African American woman lawyer from Yale Law School, and then an ordained minister. One of Polly's good friends was Maida Springer, and Maida Springer uh, was a, a, a garment worker in New York City who became the first African American to uh, be a business agent for the union. And she met Mrs. Roosevelt, and I had the real privilege of, of interviewing Maida and getting to know her where she would say, now I wasn't a good friend of Mrs. Roosevelt's like, like Polly was, but she knew when she needed to, she could call and she would get help and she could go to the White House. And she went on to have just a stellar career uh, internationally with the labor movement and representing uh, the AFL-CIO in Africa. And I wanna conclude with uh, what is one of the takeaways for me from the New Deal and from all of these wonderful women, and one that uh, really sends a message, I think, to the kinds of workshops I do with union women, is that Eleanor Roosevelt uh, believed that you had to practice what you preached. And she joined a union after she started writing her My, My Day column in 1935. In 1936, she proudly joined the American Newspaper Guild, CIO, which was considered by many in the press and in Congress to be a communist organization. But she proudly joined. She had her union, she went to meetings when it was necessary, both in Washington and in New York um, City, where different groups that, that she belonged to. And uh, she had her union card in her wallet when she died. It was creased from, uh, from having, having been in her wallet. And when she spoke to union meetings, as she often did, one of the messages she left, which was, we can't just talk, as we're doing here today, we have to act. And that's what we can do when we leave here tomorrow. Thank you. I'm just loving today. It's wonderful. <laughs> and I'm honored to be part of it. Uh, I'm going to talk about two women here who were passionate believers in the New Deal and whom I have written about. Uh, the first, Lorena Hickok, uh, didn't plan to be part of the New Deal. Um, she was a reporter for the Associated Press and one of the very few women who was covering national news and getting her stories published on the front pages. She learned her trade at the Minneapolis Tribune, where she was known to be willing to go anywhere and do anything for a story. Here is one of my favorite photographs of Hick, as she was known to everyone, uh, dressed up in engineering, engineer overalls, because she's writing a story about a legendary locomotive. Hick prized her independence and had no intention of working for the government. Here's a picture of her as a professional reporter in the Minneapolis days. But then, she was assigned to cover Eleanor Roosevelt during the 1932 campaign. And during the many hours Hick and Eleanor spent together on the campaign trail, they began to confide in each other. Although they had lived completely different lives, Hick had been brutally beaten by her father and forced to leave home at 13. And Eleanor had grown up with great privilege, as we know, but with little affection, and possibly with some abuse as well, as was mentioned this morning. 
They came to understand they had both been unhappy in their different ways, and their affection grew. Eventually became, I believe, physical and deeply pleasurable. Hick admired Eleanor enormously and thought she looked like a queen in her long gowns. And she did. She had wonderful posture. And Eleanor found an affection with Hick that was missing in the rest of her life. The closer Eleanor and Hick grew, however, the more difficult it became for Hick to continue working as a reporter. She knew too much, and she was too loyal to Eleanor to reveal it all to her bosses at the AP. Around the time FDR first took office, Hick made the wrenching decision to leave her job as a reporter. It was Eleanor's idea that Hick should go to work for Harry Hopkins and the W. PA. Hopkins hired her to go out into the field and report back to him on relief programs. He told her to go around the country and look this thing over. <laughs> Tell me what you see and hear. Don't ever pull your punches. That's the way he talked. <laughs> this is a picture of one of the Hoover era solutions for starving farmers. And here you see him holding a Red Cross garden seed package that was supposed to solve his hunger problem. Hick accepted the assignment with enthusiasm and for the next four years traveled all over the country and sent back vivid reports on what she saw. Hick had been too poor ever to have access to a car, so she didn't know how to drive. But she learned quickly. And here she is with her second car. She totaled the first car, <laughs> which she and Eleanor christened Stepchild. One of Hick's first assignments was to travel to the desperate coal towns of West Virginia. <coughs> and although she'd grown up poor and hungry in South Dakota, these coal camps in the dark hollows were like nothing she had seen before. She described the ramshackle houses, black with coal dust, children going to sleep hungry on piles of bug-infested rags, filthy water running down the gutters of what passed for a street. Here's a picture of an injured miner and his family in Scotts Run, West Virginia, in 1938, the Farm Security Administration, one of the many wonderful photographs from the Farm Security Administration. Hick wrote about what she saw in reports to Harry Hopkins, but she also described them in long letters to Eleanor, often with added personal details. What she reported about West Virginia planted the seed for Arthurdale, the very first of the New Deal homestead projects. We heard a little about that this morning. And Arthurdale provided new housing for 165 desperate coal mining families. It was flawed in some ways. Eleanor was very unhappy that it was not integrated. There were no African Americans included. And that was one of the problems with the homesteads. But the homestead project produced in all 10,900 and some new homes for people in need at a cost of $108 million. So Eleanor and Hick worked as a team. Often a letter from Hick would go first to Eleanor and then would land in FDR's basket, which we heard about this morning. Sometimes he would respond with a directive. At other times, he would just use one of Hicks' stories, not always with attribution, to impress his cabinet members. On several occasions, Eleanor and Hick went to investigate together. In March of 1934, they traveled to Puerto Rico. I'm going to see this slide again. Um, and I will point out that, uh, oh, I will mention, there, it was a situation much like the situation now in Puerto Rico. There had been a hurricane there two years before this visit, and things were in terrible shape. And um, to the right of Eleanor, or to the next to Eleanor with a long tie, mm -hmm. is Lorena Hickok. Um, Eleanor insisted on taking lots of photos to document the disaster, but Hick wrote that no photograph could do justice to the desperation of these Puerto Rican slums because photographs have no smell. Imagine a swamp with stagnant, scum-covered, muddy water everywhere, 
Pack into this area as many shacks as you can. Ramshackle, makeshift affairs made of bits of board and rusty tin. Into each room, put a family. There are over 3,000 letters between uh, Eleanor and Hick in the Roosevelt Library at Hyde Park. They chronicle their affectionate relationship. Here you see one of Eleanor's letters, and anyone who's worked on this material knows how hard her writing is to decipher. Um, and here you see one of Hick's. Uh, Hick barely, she didn't go to college, and she barely graduated from high school, but she wrote a wonderful hand. She never seemed to make a spelling mistake, and she was a wonderful writer. Uh, you said, I don't know if you can read any of this, but it's a little bit about the relationship and Hick's habit of blowing up and feeling jealous and then feeling terrible about it. Uh, but these letters are also a chronicle of the New Deal era. Although their love relationship cooled after about four years, Eleanor and Hick remained friends for life. And here is Eleanor's favorite picture of Hick, which she kept by her bed and later, later on on her mantle. When, when Eleanor died, three presidents attended the funeral at Hyde Park. When Hick died, five, five and a half years later, there was no ceremony. Her ashes were placed on a shelf at the Dapson Funeral Home where they remained for 20 years, at which time they were buried in the unclaimed remains area of the Rhinebeck Cemetery. But there is a happy postscript to this sad tale. In 2000, a local historian, an Eleanor Roosevelt biographer, Blanche Wiesencook, and a local lesbian couple got together and raised money for a memorial to Lorena Hickok, and on May 10, 2000, 32 years and nine days after Hick died, they unveiled a plaque at the Rhinebeck Cemetery. <clears throat> Lorena Hickok, Hick, AP reporter, author, activist, and friend of ER. Hick had said before she died that she would like her ashes to fertilize a tree. So the celebrants planted a dogwood near the plaque, along with the bluestone bench, where visitors come to think about the remarkable undersung chronicle, chronicler of the Depression. Years after she wrote them, many of Hicks' reports were finally published in a book called One Third of a Nation. They remain one of the most vivid accounts of the Great Depression. Hallie Flanagan was also hired by Harry Hopkins. But Harry had a, a bigger plan for Hallie Flanagan. Hall, Harry Hopkins had gone uh, to Grinnell with, uh, with Hallie and had watched her nationally recognized success since Iowa as an ex inspiring director in the theater program at Vassar. He hired her to be part of the most daring and controversial division of the WPA, Federal One. As we all know about Federal One. It was intended to put writers, visual artists, musicians, and theater people back to work. Hallie Flanagan was charged with creating the Federal Theater Project. <coughs> Hallie threw herself into the job with almost superhuman enthusiasm and energy. And over the next four years, she put thousands of actors, playwrights, set designers, and backstage workers back to work and lit up theaters all over America. She brought theater to small towns, to the boys and the CCC camps, to flood victims, to children, to many who had never seen theater before. At the same time, she launched memorable productions in the cities, including one called it Can't Happen Here, which opened simultaneously in 23 theaters around the country, in Yiddish and Spanish, as well as English. And of course, the conceit is, It Can't Happen Here is happening all over. Uh, 
It can't happen here with Sinclair Lewis's take on the fascistic tendencies he saw in America in the 1930s. It told the tale of the takeover of the American government by a homespun ignoramus. His name was Doremus Jessup. And he was elected on the corporative party ticket. Uh, so this is a scene in which a corpo, a corpo who's part of the fascist military, is lording it over a small town newspaper editor. And by the way, this is the Yiddish production that we're looking at. Hallie Flanagan was beleaguered from day one. There was never enough money, and there was endless infighting within the federal theater. But the most difficult battles were always about content. Hallie Flanagan had been one of the first women to receive a Guggenheim Fellowship, and she had used it to travel all over Europe, where she was especially moved by the activist theater of Germany and Russia. But state administrators in the federal theater wanted safe, uncontroversial programs that would also be critically acclaimed. As Halley said, any theater producer knows that you cannot achieve both of these aims simultaneously. Despite all the problems, Halley Flanagan guided many important productions to fruition. One of them was a Harlem production of Macbeth. Here you see the crowd gathered outside the Lafayette Theater in Harlem on opening night. Voodoo Macbeth, as it was called, was the brainchild of John Houston and Orson Welles. And it was a huge success in Harlem and later on the road. The witches in the production were male, a breakthrough in itself. And the Federal Theater also gave, in this production and others, backstage jobs to African Americans for the very first time. And here's, this is uh, at uh, Macbeth in, at the Lafayette. Another, that was another, as I said, another important breakthrough. The most controversial production of the Federal Theater was certainly Mark Blitzstein's the Cradle Will Rock. It was a sharp-edged populist attack on wealth and greed, and it proved too hot for the WPA administrators to handle. When the Federal Theater postponed opening night, Orson Welles and his cast staged a dramatic walk-off and reconstituted opening night without Federal Theater's blessing. It was one of Hallie Flanagan's most painful, most painful moments because she considered herself this activist, progressive, radical person, which she was. And here she was being cast as one of them. But nonetheless, The Cradle Will Rock, which be began under the Federal Theater, uh, has become a classic and has been uh, produced numerous times. I'm sure some of you may have seen it. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a great musical, and influenced Leonard Bernstein and many others who came after Blitzstein. One of the greatest of the federal successes, federal theater successes without a doubt, was a play about housing, one in a series of teaching plays called Living Newspapers. One third of a nation takes its name from FDR's second inaugural, in which he stated one third of a nation is ill-housed, ill-clothed, ill-fed. The critics were nearly unanimous in their praise. The New York Post. By the simple process of tearing a filthy old tenement out of its normal setting and putting it on the stage, the Federal Theater has succeeded in making us really see that horror as we had never seen bothered to see it before. And here you see the tenement set uh, from the New York production. And this, uh, this production began and ended with a fire. Here you see the fire. And uh, the message was that really nothing changes uh, in these tenements, you know, and that the same problems exist again and again. Uh, 
One third of a nation played to 200,000 over nine months in New York alone and traveled to 10 other cities in the country. One of the few places one third of a nation did not get a positive reception was in the United States Senate. <laughs> Where complaints were beginning to accelerate against the federally funded project that criticized government. I don't think Americans are responsible for this kind of presentation, one senator, senator grumbled. I think some foreign element must be behind this. The most dangerous enemy of the Federal Theater Project was a deeply racist congressman from Texas named Martin Dyes. Dyes was the founder of the House Committee on Un-American Activities, later called HUAC, and took it upon himself to investigate what he considered to be suspicious elements in the country. In this, he followed in the footsteps of his father, who had also been a congressman and who had warned of the dangers of illiterates from abroad with their message of Bolsheviki socialism. Dyes managed to find witnesses within the Federal Theater who reported on race mingling. One woman in particular, named Sally Saunders, reported that a black man in the company had asked her for a date. What was worse, the director, when she mentioned it to him, saw nothing wrong with it. <laughs> Sally's report made the papers. One headline read, Reds urge mixed date, blonde tells probers. <laughs> <laughs> that was the beginning of the end. Hallie Flanagan prepared a lengthy, well-argued defense, but dies and the committee only allowed her to testify for half a day. She was too eloquent, and she made them look too bad. Variety called the diminutive, diminutive vassarite a victor in her first skirmish with the committee. But unfortunately, her first skirmish would be her last. Many good people, including Eleanor Roosevelt, came to the Federal Theater's defense. In her My Day column, Eleanor wrote, I know that this project is considered as dangerous because it may harbor some communists, but I wonder if communists occupied in producing plays are not safer than communists <laughs> starving to death. <laughs> I love the comment, but in retrospect, it might not have been the most politic thing to say at that moment. But nothing helped. The WPA bill Congress sent to FDR eliminated the Federal Theater Project, and he objected, but only mildly, because he wanted everything else. On June 30th, 1939, curtains of the Federal Theater Project went down all over America. In New York, the enormously successful children's production of Pinocchio, and here were the children watching it, They staged, a, they staged a, uh, a mock funeral. They brought out a three-foot wood Pinocchio and laid him on top of a coffin. And they gathered around the coffin and recited, thus passed Pinocchio, killed by an act of Congress. <laughs> so uh, I, want to end, I want to end with something positive, uh, which is, uh, <laughs> after all that, um, an amazing, one of the most successful and most amazing, most beaut beautiful things that happened uh, in this whole in this whole story was this: uh, the Golden Gate International Exposition on Treasure Island. And I, I, I imagine many of you know of this, but it, it, it's it, it's an amazing thing. Um, the, it, it, that. Uh, it was a remarkably ambitious project on a grand scale, and it included a $1.5 million federal building with the very first theater built by the Federal Theater Project. Mm -hmm. Actually, three theaters in one, an outdoor stage, a children's theater, and a 500-seat indoor theater. 
Hallie wrote her husband that San Francisco is a large, terrific, beautiful city, and Treasure Island is the most beautiful island you ever saw, and our theater is a dream. It was a dream come true, but also as elusive as dreams can be. When the war began, Treasure Island was converted into an air base, and the Golden Gate Exposition, with its innovative theaters, was no more. After it was all over, Hallie Flanagan wrote in the New York Times that the congressmen who went after the Federal Theater were, quote, afraid of the project, but not for the reasons they mentioned on the floor of the Congress. They were afraid of the Federal Theater because it was educating the people of its vast new audience to know more about government and politics and such vital issues of the day as housing, power, agriculture, and labor. They were afraid and rightly so, of thinking people. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you to Susan Ives and everyone who played a role in organizing this amazing program. I'm happy to be involved in anything relating to the New Deal. Having been an Eleanor Roosevelt scholar in college, um, having worked at Roosevelt House under Dr. Gardner, who's here. Dr. Gardner, feel free to wave. <laughs> um, and also, I went on to write my senior thesis in, in college on Mary McLeod Bethune, and that opened the door to the graduate work that I'm doing right now. So the title of my presentation is The Bridge, Mary McLeod Bethune, and the National Youth Administration. So I'd like to start off first by giving, talking about the context in which Bethune emerged. So during the Great Depression, African Americans desperately needed government help, just like everyone else in the country. But they received what NAACP leader Walter Wright called a raw deal instead of the New Deal. Some scholars have pointed to the fact that FDR wanted to name support from Southern Democrats, which is why he allowed the leaders on the local and the state level to implement the, federal, the programs that were created on the federal level. So the highly decentralized nature of the New Deal programs enabled racial prejudice, discrimination, and segregation and implementation. So just a few examples, there are several, but the Agricultural Adjustment Act had detrimental effects on tenants farmers, sharecroppers, black landowners. As we know, the Civilian Conservation Corps was discriminatory in its hiring practice, and the few African Americans who were hired were subjected to living in segregated camps. And also the Social Security Act, which we learned of, or heard about earlier, excluded agricultural and domestic workers, many of whom, the majority of whom were African Americans. Um, th and there is a debate regarding this topic in the scholarship, African Americans in the New Deal. Some believe it's racist. Others believe that it was the FDR and his staff did the most they could do, considering the climate. Um, I am on the side of giving a balanced depiction of history that talks both about its, its highlights, the amazing things that were accomplished, but also the setbacks. And I think the two can sit at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. No one is perfect, no administration is perfect. And um, unfortunately, a lot of African-Americans received the short end of the stick. But Mary McLeod Bethune had a large role in extending the, the benefits of the New Deal to African-Americans. She was very qualified for this role. And to give a little background about her, she was born in South Carolina to former slaves in 1875. She's the 15th out of 17 children. Um, she was a highly educated woman. Um, because she was rejected from um, or denied the opportunity to go on the mission field in Africa, which is what she actually trained, the, the field that she trained for, she decided to enter the field of education and went on to found the Daytona Educational and Industrial School for Negro Girls in 1904. This school evolved into what is today Bethune Cookbook <coughs> University. It's still around in Daytona Beach, Florida. She was active in multiple African Americans' women's clubs 
and was involved in administrations before FDR's administration, such as the Hoover and Coolidge administrations, where she served as the expert on black children's welfare. In 1935, she received the NAACP Spingard Medal, which was the highest award offered by or bestowed by the NAACP. And it is her reception of this, word, of this award that gained, well, that caught the attention of FDR, Eleanor Roosevelt, and the administration. So it was her goal to again, extend the benefits of the New Deal. She served as a bridge between the government and African American community. So in, in 1935, FDR created the National Youth Administration under administration under executive order number 7086. It was an autonomous division of the Works Progress Administration. FDR sought to provide work and education for youth between ages 16 and 25. So Bethune was initially appointed to the NYA Advisory Committee along with um, Mordecai Johnson, who was the president of Howard University. But she was promoted a year later after impressing the president upon her first meeting with him regarding the NYA and she became the director of the Division of Negro Affairs in 1936. She served in this role until 1944. So as director of this new division, she became the highest paid African American in the government. She also became the highest ranking African American woman in the federal government up to that time. In this role, she championed the high level, high level positions for all African Americans, but specifically black women so we see that her involvement in a lot of black women's clubs movement heavily influenced her decision to, to do so. And she also centralized the operating structure of the NYA. So this means that a lot of the state and local administrators reported directly to her. And I didn't put it on the slide here, but she appointed several African Americans to the positions on the state and local level. She, and she believed that if segregation were gonna be, was gonna be a component of New Deal programs, black leaders should be involved in leading these programs. So in a 1936 meeting, she says, may I advise the committee that it does not matter how equipped your white supervision might be or your white leadership. It is impossible for you to enter as sympathetically and understandingly into the program of the Negro as the Negro can do. So to talk a little bit more about her accomplishments as director, she administered a budget totaling over $609,000. In today's money, that's over 10 million. That's a lot of money she's handling. And this in turn helped open the doors for over 210,000 <coughs> black youth who went on to receive a secondary and post-secondary education. She coordinated employment and work training on NYA projects to over 300 black youths and supplied health exams and health counseling to 26,000 black children. Her friendship with Eleanor Roosevelt was very important to her <coughs> and enabled her role as a bridge between the government and the black community. They became friends in the 1920s and actually met thanks to um, FDR's mother, Sarah Delano Roosevelt, who's also good friends with, with Bethune. Eleanor was very much involved in the NYA and supported Bethune in her position, as well as played her own <coughs> active role in the National Youth Administration. Eleanor sought to, quote, bring the Negro youth of our country into the mainstream of American life for the first time using the NYA, end quote. Bethune's friendship with Eleanor Roosevelt was not only um, genuine, but it was also politically pragmatic because her relationship with Eleanor helped her gain access to the president, whom she later, later developed her own good relationship with. So, there, is, there are many accounts of Bethune entering 
FDR's office for a meeting. Like she didn't have to go through mm -hmm. secretaries and she could just walk right in and he trusted her as his personal advisor and invited her to several meetings. During her role, so there's a lot <laughs> to talk about, but during her role, she also created what is known as the Black <coughs> Cabinet. This was officially called the Federal Council on Negro Affairs. And what the Black Cabinet essentially did, or what she, her goal was to bring together all African American leaders in the federal government at this time together to discuss socioeconomic barriers that the black community faced. And then they would come up with policy changes, or well, suggest policy changes, that would ameliorate these issues. And Bethune is the one who then took these, these suggestions to the president, either directly or through Eleanor Roosevelt. I imagine it was included in that box um, next to FDR's bed that um, Eleanor is known to keep full. During this time, she played a vital role in shifting the, the black vote. So her position in the government was very influential to a lot of African Americans. There, up to this time, there weren't very many. So to see not only African American, but African American woman in such a powerful position helped turn their hearts towards FDR as someone who was willing to consider the needs of, of African Americans and also put them in a position to influence policy changes. And she also played a more active role in shifting the black vote <coughs> through her cross country trips where she advocated the benefits of the NYA during Roosevelt's campaign for re-election in 1936. So before, prior to this, African Americans were largely members of the Republican Party, which was known as the Party of Lincoln. And after this shift, the Democratic Party became <coughs> much more eclectic in its makeup. And in conclusion, uh, Bethune was one of the most accomplished and effective leaders in African American history, or we can just say American history. Um, she utilized her leadership position in the National Youth Administration to help ease the suffering black people endured during the Great Depression by extending the benefits of the New Deal to them. On the right, you see a bronze statue honoring Bethune in Washington, DC. This is the first statue built on public land in DC to honor an African American and a woman. So I'm very happy that this stance today was created in the 70s. And um, I hope a lot of more people learn about her and all her accomplishments. She lived a long and successful life and I'm only sharing a small fraction of that with you today. So thank you. How's everybody doing today? I hope this will be an antidote to what's going on in Washington last week, last month, last year. You know, I could go on and on and on and on. And on. So, um, I'm honored to return to my alma mater to present this research. This is the first time I've presented it since getting my doctorate in 2013. Um, all praises. Thank you. All praises to the many African American scholars who paved the path before me. Mary McLeod Bethune, educator, activist, and prominent Harlem Renaissance figure, is one of the ancestors whose hard work has made my academic career possible. Thank you, Sister Scholar Ashley, for your presentation. Very, very briefly, the Harlem Renaissance was a period of extraordinary artistic output from and within the black community. It includes art, writing, music, theater, dance, and film. And thank you, Susan, for your contributions. Your book was fabulous. I read it years ago. Uh, the Harlem Renaissance represents a point in history when there was a redefinition of what it meant to be African in the context of the American culture. Positive self-regard and historical reclamation were foregrounded during a period of time when structural inequality, racist treatment, and violence against black people was a common occurrence. We're seeing that again today, exacerbation of that. The period of 1920 to 1940 was a revolutionary time 
for black people in Harlem, in the United States, and the world. Locally, there was an artist named Sergeant Johnson, who was one of the few recognized Harlem Renaissance artists from the West Coast. He had a home and a studio in Berkeley. I, was part, I am part of the preservation committee that is going to place a plaque to commemorate Johnson in the West Berkeley neighborhood where I live. Please contribute to this project. There are flyers on the table. Did I do that good, Harvey? <laughs> That's that plug. <clears throat> My dissertation is on the intersection between the Harlem Renaissance and the New Deal. The research I conducted at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture proves that the New Deal policies and fiscal support for the arts and black communities were overwhelmingly beneficial. During the time of the New Deal, African Americans were about 10% of the population, and they comprised between 15 and 20% of the WPA workforce. The ability to have gainful employment mitigated some of the devastating effects that somebody spoke about earlier of the Great Depression on the African American population. A 1939 annual WPA report stated that, quote, wages paid nearly 400,000 Negro workers employed on projects of the WPA in 1938 and the early part of this year benefited some 1,500,000 persons, including dependents. It was the presence of 34 adult education centers that added to the rise of literacy rates in Harlem. Quote, students seem to like it. For at the end of the first year, the Federal Art Project boasted that in New York City and its vicinity, 50,000 children and adults were being reached weekly through the teaching force. Conversely, average weekly attendance dropped from 30,000 in 1938 to 10,000 in 1940 after the end of the New Deal. Despite these positive statistics, as Ashley has spoken about, any discussion of race and the New Deal is complicated by unjust norms and policies. In many areas of the country, New Deal agencies followed the laws of segregation. Initially, African-American artists were paid less than their white counterparts. This practice was subsequently stopped. Under the leadership of Harry Hopkins and supported by Roosevelt's Executive Order 7046, it became illegal to discriminate in hiring New Deal employees. The Harlem Community Arts Center opened in 1937 as one of the largest of 48 WPA-sponsored art centers in the country. In attendance at the opening were Eleanor Roosevelt, A. Philip Randolph, and James Weldon Johnson. The Amsterdam News reporter wrote, quote, in her afternoon visit, Mrs. Roosevelt remarked that she thought the center was a splendid enterprise and was happy to see it established in Harlem. She spoke at length with the teachers and remarked that she was very impressed with their enthusiasm, end quote. At the Harlem Community Arts Center, classes, events, and roundtable discussions were available day and night, five days a week. 16 months after opening, over 1,500 over 1,500 adults and children took classes, and almost 71,000 people participated in the activities. A WPA report by Mary Fraser describes the contributions. Quote, since 1935, the Federal Art Project of the Work Progress Administration has been engaged in teaching art to talented children and adults in Harlem and providing works of art for public buildings. Beginning with one free art class in Harlem, the project has expanded to its present size of 15 art centers with a total enrollment of 2,800, conducted at neighborhood centers, at schools, at churches, YMCAs, and in the studios of individual artists. Gwendolyn Bennett. 
Gwendolyn Bennett and Augusta Savage share the social challenges of being black, being women, being artists. Despite the barriers thrust between them and opportunities, they each made remarkable contributions to the arts, to arts administration, locally and nationally. Both Gwendolyn Bennett and Augusta Savage were engaged with New Deal agencies. In 1936, Savage was an assistant supervisor in the WPA Federal Art Project in Harlem. She was the first director of the Harlem Community Arts Center, followed by Gwendolyn Bennett, who assumed that role from 1938 to 1941. Gwendolyn Bennett was involved in the WPA's Federal Writers Project and Federal Art Project. She was an assistant supervisor in 1937. Both of these women were members of the Citizens Committee for the Harlem Community Arts Center, a group which provided money for rental and materials. First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt was an honorary member of this committee. <clears throat> Speaking of the center's mission, Gwendolyn Bennett stated, quote, the quiet harmonies of soft greens, reds, browns, and white help soothe the turbulent lives of children who come to us from the city streets and from overcrowded underprivileged homes. The spacious, well-lighted studio lifts the child out of the memory of his cramped home life and gives him a sense of release in which he may enjoy his exploration into creative fields. Augusta Savage was one of the founding members of the Harlem Artists Guild in 1935. This was an artist advocacy group focused on getting more African Americans to be involved in the, new year, in the New Deal. They succeeded in getting over 100 artists hired and advocated for increased wages and opportunities. But supervisory positions were still very difficult for black people to obtain. Gwendolyn Benetta Bennett was born in Texas in 1902. She was educated at Pratt Institute and Columbia University. As well as being an illustrator, she served as an editor, a literary news column writer. She was a multifaceted artist. She wrote ballads, sonnets, and poetry. Like a number of artists of her era, Bennett also studied art in France a more welcoming environment than in the United States for a black woman. After leaving the Harlem Community Arts Center, she established the Jefferson School for Democracy and the George Washington Carver School. Both were shut down in the 1940s by the House Committee on Un-American Activities. <laughs> Journal covers. <clears throat> Gwendolyn Bennett produced illustrations for journal covers. The Crisis, a record of the darker races, your right image, began in 1910. It was the official magazine for the NAACP. W.E.B. Du Bois served as an editor. The Crisis continues to operate as a separate literary venture today. Bennett illustrates a pastoral scene here and she's showing her skill in illustrating landscapes. The title of the piece is The Pipes of Pan. In Greek mythology, Pan is known as the patron saint of shepherds and he's connected with literature and theater. An interesting resonance with Bennett's career, which included writing literary criticism and a play, Susan. Opportunity, a journal of Negro life, your left image started in 1923 and was the National Urban League's journal. Bennett served as assistant editor and her poems were published from 1923 to 1926. In the foreground, we have a woman dressed as a flapper, a popular style for the 1920s. 
In the background, at a smaller scale, we have palm trees and women dressed in the kind of exoticized clothing that was worn by Josephine Baker. <clears throat> These figures are presented as silhouettes, a style named by Aaron Douglas as Egyptian form. With an abstract image of the sun, the location of this scene is left up to the viewer, who is positioned as a witness to a moment of dance and exaltation. Augusta Savage. Augusta Savage was born in 1892 in Green Cove, Florida. As a young woman, she attended Cooper Union after moving to New York. She also studied in France. Savage was the first African-American woman to be elected to the National Association of Women Painters. She sculpted busts of W.E.B. Du Bois, Marcus Garvey, and James Weldon Johnson. After leaving the Harlem Art Center, she was the administrator for the Salon of Contemporary Negro Art, the first gallery dedicated to the exhibition and sale of work by black artists. Your left image is Lift Every Voice and Sing, also known as The Harp. It was commissioned in 1937 by the New York World's Fair. The piece was 16 feet high, cast in plaster, and painted with a bronze patina. There are 12 choir members in the midst of a song, and these images can also be read as the strings of a harp being held by an oversized hand. A male figure in the front holds a plaque with the musical notes from Lift Every Voice and Sing, which became known as the National Negro Anthem in 1919. Savage received a silver medal for this piece, but it was later destroyed because there was nowhere to store it and no funds to cast it in bronze. I argue in my dissertation that if this piece had been funded by the WPA, it might have been permanently installed in Harlem, like Aaron Douglas's Aspects of Negro Life murals, which are on permanent display at the Schomburg. After the World's Fair closed, Savage was employed by the Federal Art Project as a consultant. The other image on your right shows a close sample of Savage's ability to sculpt life-sized figures of African-American subjects. This piece depicts a closeness between an African-American woman and man. With her head downcast, the man is comforting this woman whose face resembles Augusta Savage's in affect and hairstyle. In the Art Digest of 1938, the great labor organizer, A. Philip Randolph, wrote, quote, fundamentally, the realization of the expression of art is one of the earliest awakenings of human consciousness. It is one of the earliest assertions of the Negro people. Art partakes of the quality of universality and its appeal to mankind is not confined by the boundaries of time or the frontiers of race or climes. My research shows that the New Deal support for artists in the 1930s had a tremendous effect on African American literacy and community well-being. Government support provided art access to all, especially vulnerable publics that include youth, the poor, elders, rural communities, and people of color. The new New Deal will usher in a world where affordable housing will be beautified by murals, paintings, artistic furnishings, and objects enhanced by art, music, and performances. Community gardens will be populated with sculptures. <clears throat> the writer Arundhati Roy says that, quote, another world is possible, end quote. I believe that another world is necessary and we are all part of its creation. We are the new New Deal. Thank you.
not all, it's not only our panel, but it's the whole day. You know, we keep hearing this theme over and over again about perseverance. I mean, every single one of the women we have talked about has grit and amazing perseverance. And also, I would say creativity. There's just so much creativity in how they figured out their lives. So, panel, I would love if any of you have anything you would like to say about this grit and perseverance of these wonderful women we've been talking about. There's an anecdote about Bethune literally standing up to the KKK um, who were ready to attack her school that she founded in Daytona Beach, Florida. So I think perseverance and grit and courage is exemplified by that, as well as just everyday resistance. You know, it, it takes a lot of courage and persistence to serve as an African-American woman in such a high position struggling for the rights of African Americans in a very oppressive society. And, and they were, and they were also brave. I mean, you weren't supposed to be a woman sculptor. You weren't supposed to be a woman who loved women. You were not supposed to be a woman that started a school. You were not supposed to be a woman that ran a theater company. I mean, they were incredibly brave and strong to step over those lines. Roosevelt's relationship with the Union women was that some scholars have described it as, you know, the Union women were sort of, especially in the 20s and then in the early 30s, you know, just sort of overwhelmed and impressed with, you know, the Roosevelt showing interest in them. And Frances Perkins, in, in fact, said that almost everything Franklin knew about unions he learned from uh, Roche Schneiderman and the Women's Trade Union League. But I think what's apropos to this question is how much Eleanor Roosevelt took from those union women, how reciprocal their relationship was, and how much she learned about persistence. And, you know, the unions had been working for years for these things, and they continued to work. And there's a, she addressed the 1940 uh, anniversary uh, convention of the International Lady Garment Workers Union. And there were 20,000 people in the World Fair Plaza in, in New York City. And Luigi Antonini was the head of, the, of Local 89, which was the Italian Workers Union. There were some 50,000 Italian workers. He brought the Metropolitan Opera to sing for the union workers. But Eleanor spoke there, and then she wrote about it in her My Day column and talked about both how, how much unions she had learned that, you know, that they really represented democracy at the local level in places close to home, but how much strength she took um, from seeing these workers, seeing these people who went out every day and did the work. Um, and I think similar to the way she dealt with the uh, A. Philip Randolph and the, and the uh, because she rode trains all the time, and <laughs> the workers, you know, on the trains and the, any number of, uh, of any of industries that, that you can pick, but how how they how they reinforced and and kept each other going by their uh, their service and their persistence, and so they gained the, the the union women gained a great deal from working with Eleanor Roosevelt and seeing how hard she actually worked. You know, I mean, there was no union hall too small, no step, step you know steps too high to climb. She would be there. You invited her, and she was there. But then she also took from them a real appreciation of what a long haul this was going to be. So there's a, just that kind of mutual respect, which I think is really important to persistence. Uh, I was struck by something that John Levinger said this morning about his grandmother, that she actually had a second birth. Um, and I think she had many rebirths. And she was definitely the quintessential exa example of a lifelong learner. She continued to learn and grow. You know, uh, if you look at her in the beginning when she was going out to make political speeches, and Louis Howe helped her because her voice was very high and she giggled a lot. 
And you know, it, she learned how to do that so much better in her relationship with Hick, which is one of the things I talk about in the book. Hick was a really good writer, and the truth is, in the beginning, at least my feeling about Eleanor's writing is that uh, it wasn't very good. It was very sentimental, and those first books were very preachy, and she came off as an aristocratic woman trying to tell other women how to behave. Um, and, and Hick helped her with that, and then the later writing became much better because she talked about herself, you know, and I think her memoirs are the best writing she did. Um, so her, I think her writing really improved. Um, certainly, you know, she got much more savvy as a politician over the years. And um, I mean, one of the challenges of, about, of writing about her life all the way to the end was that there, it was so huge, you know, and it, kept, it just kept going and going and going. Um, and really, after FDR died, some, some <coughs> of the most important part, maybe the most important part of her life happened after that. So. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of grit, I think Eleanor was the great example, but also in terms of learning and growing. And of course, first was Mademoiselle Silvestre, you know, that the very important time at Allenswood, uh, which was so formative, um, but then continuously throughout her life. Okay, so there's a number of traits we need to be women like this. <laughs> grit, determination, perseverance, courage, creativity. I think also, like, maybe the ability to only sleep two hours a night. I think <laughs> these women were awesome. I, I'd love to also ask the panel if there's anything, you know, today we're doing a lot about history and tomorrow about inspiring and moving into, you know, today's lives, where we can go. But let's have a preview of any thoughts you, any of you have about what can we learn from these women, or how can they inspire us? You know, while we have you here, what thoughts occur to you about what we can take forward from them? Well, one of the things that I've tried to do as a direct result of, of finishing this book on Eleanor Roosevelt, I was ready to, you know, my academic writing and policy stuff, and. I mean, you just, once you've worked on it, I, I think you can't do that. <laughs> you know, you then start thinking about, well, how can I write columns? You know, how can I, um, and, and a, a friend, uh, a good union sister said to me, you know, Bridget, I, the book's great, I really love it, and it's the first thing written, and not just about the, the women in the labor movement, but it's about the, the labor movement writ large. And she said, a whole lot of people aren't gonna write it. You need to do the really, you know, short synopsis, do a workshop, I'm like, no, wait, <laughs> I just finished the book. What do you mean I have to do all this? But I have found that young people, kids doing talks in schools, people are eager to hear about leaders and they're eager to hear about the Francis Perkins who, you know, Eleanor's gotten a lot more, you know, recognition than, than Francis Perkins, but she's crucial um, to our, our whole workplace um, situation. And going out and telling these stories, uh, you know, we're all here pretty dedicated, but how do we go into the schools? How do we go yeah, into, uh, you know, colleges and to not just the little labor people here, but, that, you know, to take these messages about, you know, the, some of the, like Mary McLeod Bethune, who, you know, who needs to be known about in, uh, you know, in every community. So what I try to do in these workshops is how do you take this back home? You know, how can you go back to your community and who are the mentors, who are the leaders who haven't been honored? And to kind of come up with ways that, in, in this case, it would be all of you going back to your immediate communities and saying, well, is there someone that I don't know about, that I can write about, that I can do an op-ed, that I can get interviewed on a radio show, or have a, you know, uh, I mean, so, Sort of things like that. Because, you know, right now, government's not going to do it for us. <laughs> That's, and then, as Eleanor always, always talked about, and Perkins and all of these women were involved in the political process. It's not over there for other people to do. You know, we all have to be registering people to vote and, you know, supporting candidates and running for office. So, that kind of thing. 
I think it's a very, very fertile moment. Um, <clears throat> I think that uh, misogyny, patriarchy, and overt racism has really revealed itself, you know, more than ever before. Um, not that it didn't exist before, I'm, I'm not a post-racial person, but it has revealed itself in all of its nakedness. But also revealed is our power to cooperate, to organize, to push back, and to say no. So we've got those two things going on, and I think we need to weigh more in on the side of organizing and saying no and shutting it down mm -hmm. wherever and whenever we see it. Because this is a moment, you know, in terms of, you know, my kid who's a teenager and our grandchildren and the rest of the world, if we want it to look like the kind of world that all of these women and all of these men and FDR, if we want it to look like <coughs> the kind of world we want to live in, we're going to have to shut it down, stick together, you know, and change it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right on.